Ipswich, county town of Suffolk, the oldest English town in Britain. This town has witnessed many waves of migration, right from Anglo-Saxon times to the present day. More than 17% of the people in Ipswich is of an ethnic background other than white British, and over 70 different languages are spoken here. Ipswich, in a true sense, is a multicultural town and has received its bequest of diverse culture since its foundation in the 7th century. This film is an attempt to trace the history of migration in Ipswich and Suffolk. So here we are at Sutton Hoo, and in a way this is where our story begins. It's a phenomenal landscape, um, and we now know that it's a landscape of Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Scandinavian burials. But in the 1930s, Mrs. Pretty, the widow who lived in that house behind us, she began to sense that there were spirits in this landscape. So she contacted the uh, curator at Ipswich Museum, who sent her an archaeologist to work on the sites. In 1939, in the summer, he excavated this large mound here, and that turned out to be the phenomenal ship burial, the uh, icon of Sutton Hoo. The Anglo-Saxon people belonged to Germanic tribes who migrated to Britain from Jutland, Anglia, Frisia and the Saxon coast. Dr Richard Hoggett talked to us about the major events in Suffolk in the early medieval period. It seems from the archaeology that we're looking at a maritime people who are coming across the North Sea and as you might expect, the, their main entry points into East Anglia and indeed into England at a, at a wider level are the major rivers and what we see very clearly is a strong settlement pattern of, of early Anglo-Saxon occupation in river valleys. So taking the, the most immediately local context to Bury St Edmunds, the Lark Valley where we see the, the major Roman town of Icklingham sitting and but where we also find places like West Stowe and Culford and other sites as well. Um, we see a very, very strong um, early Saxon settlement in, in that river valley. Near Sutton Hoo, for example, we have the River Deben, which is a very, very clear entry point into the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. And when you look at the map of the North Sea and you look at the, the homelands where the Anglo-Saxons are coming from, um, you can see very clearly that they're setting off from one coast they're sailing north or, or northeast and northwest and effectively hitting another coast and following the major rivers inland. Archaeology has been a revelation for understanding the Anglo-Saxon past. Anglo-Saxon society was hierarchical, in which the most prominent ranks were the king and his noblemen or thanes. The vast majority of the people lived by farming in small rural communities. It has also discovered that the spinning and weaving of wool was an important part of the local economy in early Saxon times. In the early 1970s, a group of Cambridge students got involved in reconstructing the Anglo-Saxon houses, which had just been excavated here at West Stowe. Where we're standing at the moment is on a sandy knoll where um, uh, about 1500 years ago, an early Anglo-Saxon settlement came and built houses and pits and farmed. Now, this was excavated in the 1960s and you couldn't find any houses there because they were all built of wood that had rotted. So what the archaeologists found were pits and post holes. I came to the site in 1969, which is midway through the archaeological seasons and uh, worked for the then county archaeologist, um, Dr. Dr. West. Well, we were excavating um, halls surrounded by Grubenheiser, the archaeological ground plan, um, and uh, we had a series of excavations going on to about 1972. But the site is a multi-period site, although obviously from the reconstruction point of view we are concentrating on the, the Saxon side. I mean, we knew pretty well from the excavated remains of the site and from other historical evidence what was available to the Saxons. I mean, they had sharp cutting tools, uh, they had all sorts of skills in the working of wood. We could find from the archaeological remains, particularly of the burnt houses on the site, what woods were used in the construction of the houses and in which order, i.e. where in the house were they placed, because the house obviously collapses in a predictable way, and you can roughly work that out. Anglo-Saxons believed in many deities, 
a pantheon of Germanic gods and goddesses, each with their own rituals and requirements. They worshipped gods of nature and revered special places with springs, wells, rocks and trees. Religion was not a source of spiritual revelation. It was a means of ensuring success in daily life and material things, including the fertility of their crops and livestock. Pagan religion, uh, which is practiced by the, the early Anglo-Saxons in the 5th, 6th and into the 7th centuries. Now, that religion, as we've interpreted it from the archaeology, seems to revolve around a number of deities who represent different elements of the natural environment and who represent different elements of uh, what are seen as um, social virtues, if you like. So you have you know, gods of love, gods of war and so on, but at the same time you seem to have gods associated with fire, um, with the earth, with the moon and, and so on. So there are di different deities representing different aspects of the world around us. Now in terms of East Anglia, we hear from the pages of Bede that uh, Pope Gregory the Great sent uh, the missionary Augustine to Anglo-Saxon England and he landed, uh, Augustine that is, landed in Kent in 597 AD. And he converts the, the Kingdom of Kent and the, the Kentish King changes faith. And at that point we hear that, that Redwald, the King of East Anglia at that point in history, uh, who's very likely to be buried at Sutton Hoo, uh, he is a subservient king to the King of Kent in these early years of the 7th century. And he takes the, uh, the baptism, he becomes a Christian king. King Redvald's successors strongly promoted Christianity, bringing missionaries from Europe to preach and minister to the local people. St. Botolph was one of the earliest and most revered of East Anglian saints. Eichenhoe was a marshy spur surrounded on all sides by the branches of the River Old, which would have made it something of an East Anglian holy island. St. Botolph's church in Eichen is the most likely site of St. Botolph's Abbey. Excavations have revealed part of a large stone Saxon cross incorporated into the wall of the church tower. But we're told that when Redwald returns from Kent to his, uh, to his homeland, to the East Anglian homeland, he lapses back to his pagan ways. So in the 7th and 8th centuries, many people, if not most, converted to Christianity. And we know this, this becomes very evident in their burial practices. They stop cremating, they start inhumating, uh, burying whole bodies in the ground within designated sacred areas within the settlements, rather than in uh, separate burial grounds away from the village. And they also stop burying with grave goods. Well, we're standing here on top of the famous Mound One at, at Sutton Hoo. There's been a very long running discussion about whether or not this is a, a pagan burial ground or a Christian burial ground. And that discussion hinges very much on the historical references to Redwald and whether or not he was actually a Christian. Um, the general consensus now is that this is very much a, a pagan burial ground. And the, the prevailing interpretation is that what it represents is a, a sort of final flourish of paganism in the face of Christian missionaries in the region. Now the, the cemetery here dates from the first half of the 7th century and we know that's the period that Christianity is taking hold within East Anglia and indeed across the wider Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And so it seems that what we have here is a very sort of last hurrah, if you like, for the pagan burial practices. The grave goods themselves represent Redwald's society and his, his activities. We have a, a very rich set of armour, the, the famous face mask and uh, shoulder clasps that hold a cloak. We have weaponry placed in there as well. Um, speaking of a, of a warrior prince, a warrior king. But we also have a lot of other material that indicates um, society and indicates feasting and drinking and gift giving and all of the other things that come with the role of being a king. More crucially, when we look at when they, where those goods come from, they're coming from all across Europe. A vast trade network has provided this material. The coins have come from Francia. There are bowls and dishes which have come from Constantinople. A truly international network has supplied this material to East Anglia in the 7th century. This period is really important for the development of English society for two main reasons. 
Um, Christianity first developed here. It grew, it put down roots. Most people converted to Christianity. The second reason is language. The Angles and the Saxons spoke a language which is actually the foundation of the English that we speak today. Many of the words we use uh, come from that time and in fact um, Norfolk and Suffolk refer to the North folk and the South folk. England is Angle land, the land of the Angles. Uh, Ipswich is uh, originally Gipperswick, Gip being corner and Wick being the place or the port on the corner of the river. Dr Jenny Amos from the University Campus Suffolk specialises in sociolinguistics and phonology. Her work is centred on the variation and historical development of dialects across East Anglia. Anglo-Saxon um, is one of the earliest forms of language um, that we can uh, reliably uh, investigate. It was a runic language, so the written form of it is very, very different to what we have now. And as a result, the spelling system um, that derived from that is very different as well. Anglo-Saxon is from the, the Germanic part of the, the language families tree, and so um, it belongs to a group of languages that doesn't have what we call the hard k sounds. So k and g sounds wouldn't have been present in Anglo-Saxon. As a result, any words that you have um, that have these sounds wouldn't be our Anglo-Saxon words. So a word like shirt, for example, is very much an Anglo-Saxon word because it has a sh sound um, that was prevalent at that time. During the early 7th century, under King Redvold, East Anglia emerged as a powerful Anglo-Saxon kingdom. In 865 AD, the Anglo-Saxon chronicles tell us that East Anglia was invaded by the Danish Great Heathen Army. The term Viking simply meant pirate, and they targeted the monasteries, taking the gold and destroying their texts and literature. The Danes returned to East Anglia more violently in 869, wintering at Thetford before being attacked by the forces of King Edmund of East Anglia. Well, we're told very little in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle itself about Edmund's death, except that he was killed by the Vikings. But later, a tradition tells us that uh, he was shot full of arrows in a, a manner reminiscent of St. Sebastian and ultimately beheaded. And we're told that, that his head was thrown into a thorn bush where tradition has it that uh, it uh, was identified by wolves who, who called out to people seeking his body and, and draw them to the, the right place so that they could reunite the head and body. And ultimately Edmund's remains were returned here to what became known as Bury St Edmunds and placed in a, a shrine which became one of the foremost cult centres of later Anglo-Saxon England. And the area behind me here is the the holiest of holies, if you like, the eastern end of the Abbey Church at Bury St Edmunds, which grew up on the site of, of his shrine. And throughout the medieval period, his shrine was, was one of the foremost destinations for pilgrims of, of every kind. The main period of Old Norse influence on English is approximately between about 750 and about 1050. There were Viking visitations um, to the country long before then in sort of dribs and drabs and they were a lot more exploratory, a lot more peaceful. Whereas the second wave of, if you like, Viking invasions were a lot more hostile, a lot more military operated, um, the sort of burn, pillage and ransack kind of era. Um, and that's when we started to see a lot more heavily influenced um, language effects in this period. Because the Vikings, the Old Norse, were living among the Anglo-Saxons um, in everyday life. Uh, they were trading. Once, once Dane law was established, they were trading. There was intermarriage. The influence of Old Norse on Anglo-Saxon was a lot more intimate. So we picked up a lot of the everyday language, uh, everyday words, um, everyday trade trading words, uh, trading conventions, and also structural um, items as well. So our present day pronouns, third person pronouns of them, there and they, actually came from the Old Norse, them, there and, and they. They, um, if you like, they kicked out the Old English um, forms in favour of the Old Norse forms, which goes to show how closely linked the two languages were at that point in time. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle tells us that the Vikings raided our coasts, they destroyed villages and they burnt monasteries, destroying written records. 
what they've left behind is at least 3,000 place names, village names, of which one is behind me, Risby. And the B-Y element of a village or a place name tells us that it was once a Viking settlement here. The Vikings were a mixture of Scandinavian groups representing Danish and Norwegian primarily. And as a result, depending on where the Danes and the, the Norwegians settled across the country in the Dane law that was set up, um, which encompassed practically everywhere in England apart from the Kingdom of Wessex, you then have more Norwegian derived place names and more Danish derived place, place names as a way of kind of tracking where each of the um, nationalities, if you like, where each of the subgroups of the Vikings actually settled. So for example, Thwaite, uh, place names ending in Thwaite is very Norwegian, um, such as the Suffolk village of Thwaite, um, for example, and words that have Stowe and Toft, for example, are more Danish origin, so Lower Stoft and Felixstowe, for example, would be more Danish settlements. Well, as well as the, the sound changes that they, they brought in, such as the hard k and g sounds, um, which gave us um, wonderful everyday words like sky and freckle. You wouldn't think of freckle being a particularly um, exotic word, but, um, but that's derived from Old Norse. In the year 1066, the Saxon Danish rulers of England were overthrown and replaced by new invaders, the Normans. The Norman conquest mainly involved the transfer of power, governance and estates to a minority Norman-French elite, the Norman aristocracy. The Norman conquest is much more subtle and we see it in a number of different ways. Primarily, the Norman conquest is a political takeover. Uh, we see that most directly in the, the translation of the king and the establishment of William as the, as the new monarch. But in the period that follows, we see the replacement of all of the major Anglo-Saxon landholders. And one of the, the really interesting things about Doomsday Book is when the survey is conducted in 1086, not only is it recording who holds the land in 1086, it also records who held the land in 1066 as well. And so we're able to see that translation from an Anglo-Saxon landholder to effectively a Norman elite landholder in that 20 year period between the conquest and the survey. The Normans gave a corporate stamp to the landscape with their stone buildings, their castles, churches, monasteries, and some secular houses with its distinctive solid architectural style, which we call Romanesque, meaning like the Romans. Framlingham is a good example. This was a Saxon estate. This included a huge outer curtain wall, which is very much a statement of power stamped on the landscape, a symbol of military and feudal authority. The Normans developed a strong feudal paternalistic society whereby most people were tied to the land in a social hierarchy ultimately dependent on the king. At the same time they really developed the economy encouraging trade and developing towns, markets and ports. The Norman style of architecture which we refer to as Romanesque because it's reminiscent of, of classical Roman architecture um, has a number of distinctive characteristics. The main one is the semicircular arch which is, is very very typical of, of the Romanesque style and we see it used in doorways such as the, the doorway behind me here in the Norman Tower, one of the, the gateways to the Abbey at Bury St Edmunds but we also see it used in the window openings as well and so again you have um, rows of, of semicircular topped windows. We can contrast that kind of architecture with the, the later architecture that we see on, on my other hand here, uh, which is, is Gothic and is typified by pointed archways where we, we start to see the, the pinnacle of, of windows and uh, intricate tracery being introduced to the, the window frames themselves. And that's what then goes on to develop throughout the course of the medieval period. The Norman influence on the language was at a different level. It was very much more upper class, very much more educated. Because at this point in time, um, after the Norman, um, if you like, invasion and conquering, we then had a French aristocracy and a lot of the scribes, um, the, the Chancery English that was set up was very much based on Latin and Greek, so very educated, very continental varieties um, of language and as a result the type of items that came into the language at this point were less everyday. They were more specialist kind of language, more specialist kind of lexical items, so words. We got, it's estimated that around 10,000 words came into our 
vocabulary around this period of time and we're sort of talking about words like government um, and uh, jury, judge, uh, divine, uh, temperance, you know, so, so very specialised words in terms of religion and fashion and, and government and, and law. Dr Nick Amor's research on trade and industry in late medieval Ipswich has opened a window onto the cultural diversity of Ipswich and Suffolk at that time. Ipswich was one of the three early Anglo-Saxon ports, uh, together with London and Southampton. Um, and save for a fairly short period after the Norman conquest, um, it remained a very important port um, throughout the, the Middle Ages. And its importance lay in its proximity to what was then known as the, the Low Countries. Uh, an area that stretched from Picardy in France all the way through to what we would now regard as, as the Netherlands. And in, in the Middle Ages, um, transporting goods by river or by sea was um, much cheaper, much easier and really much quicker than doing so by, by road. And therefore the countries um, uh, along that strip of low countries um, were in a way very close to, to Ipswich uh, and easier to, to get to than most parts of England. Lavenham, a small town in Suffolk. In the medieval period it was among the 20 wealthiest towns in England. Lavenham prospered from the cloth trade in the 15th and 16th century with the town's blue broadcloth being a major export the town's prosperity at this time can be seen in the lavishly constructed church of St Peter and St Paul, which demonstrates the town's medieval wealth. The Guildhall is situated in the town's marketplace, which became Lavenham's principal meeting place and centre of business. It goes back to the early 14th century, um, around about 1330. At that time, we'd been exporting fleeces straighten the sheep's back, this stuff, out through the North Sea ports of Suffolk, across to Flanders, modern day Belgium, the Netherlands, for weavers there to turn it into woolen cloth and sell it back to us. Um, we, the, the, the merchants, it took them a long time to get this idea, but they did. Why don't we make the woolen cloth here and get all the profits ourselves? King Edward III, because he was taxing the exports, but he said, in, in, in 14th century speak, OK, guys, if I can't tax the export, I'll tax you. Go ahead. And what he did, the king did, was to arrange for a small nucleus of Flemish weavers to come over here to Suffolk. We now have a Suffolk population which can weave woolen cloth. And that's how the industry started. And it lasted for 200 years. They got very rich. The merchants got <coughs> filthy rich, pardon the expression. They were the... Rothschilds of their time, um, the, even the workers made a good living. So we had a now wool industry covering Suffolk and bits of uh, South Norfolk, North, North Essex. As the industry grew here, we probably had at its height about 30 clothiers and that is matched by probably nearly 30 open hall houses that we could see around Lavenham. The clothiers were the only ones able to build them. They built, they could afford the substantial oak that was necessary. They often put more oak in than was necessary, purely to show their wealth. They could employ carpenters to decorate their buildings, introducing dragon posts, oriel windows, um, jetted overhangs, beautifully carved. It all showed off their wealth. Well, this yeah. is a very interesting house. This is called Mollet House. Uh, the Mollet being the little star in the top left-hand corner of the spandrel, which is the curved wood across the top of the door. But it's a merchant's house. This was the home of William Jacob. He was the uh, merchant that gave Lavenham its market cross. So the door is just under two metres wide, and that would be the width of a broadcloth. So the merchant could take that through, store it in the back, and then he would have waited until he'd got enough cloth worthy of a trip to London. Mm. 
the door here on the first floor is really to either deliver or to collect um, yarn. Uh, the, the merchant would have come along with his horse and cart there would probably be a little pulley, little wheel with a rope and he could load in fleece that he was delivering to the lady that would have lived in this house and he would probably collect yarn that she had already spun and load into his cart and take that on to the next phase of the um, process. So it could be to the dyer, it could be to the weaver. The close of the Middle Ages, um, it's, which is, is a very important port, um, it's exporting wool and then increasingly cloth uh, because of various um, reasons. Uh, the, the, the wool trade goes into decline during the 1400s and the, the cloth industry um, expands. So you see a lot of cloth going out of Ipswich to the Baltic, to the Low Countries and even long distance um, to, uh, to, to Spain um, and Gascony. And therefore there's, there's a close connection with most of what we would regard as, as Northern Europe. And that close connection uh, meant that not only uh, goods, but also people uh, were coming and going, um, and particularly people from, from the Low Countries, what uh, were then regarded as, as the Dutch. And as uh, the ships got bigger, during the course of the 15th century, um, more and more sailors were coming on the ships and because it took longer to uh, unload and load these ships, they were staying longer in Ipswich. And you see that reflected in the trade of the inns um, in the, the, uh, the quayside areas of St Mary, the, the parish of St Mary Quay. Um, in Ipswich um, and some of them were staying and they were getting married and they were integrating with the Ipswich community. Between the 12th and 17th centuries Ipswich was a port for the Hanseatic League for imports and exports to the Baltic, one of the richest and most important ports of the country. Ipswich has probably always been a conduit for skills and ideas as well as merchandise and people. In medieval times, we know that skilled workers came to live in Ipswich and the surrounding area from the Low Countries, today's Holland and Belgium, including brewers, brickmakers and tanners. During the religious wars that developed from the 15th century, skilled craftsmen, including weavers, came as refugees from Flanders and in successive centuries from Holland and France. But Ipswich, as far as we know, is the first complete post-Roman settlement in English history, which makes the town very significant. It makes it the oldest English town. As the medieval period developed and as trade expanded, you can imagine people coming in from ever further afield. Um, certainly there's evidence of a Jewish population in the town. There's a Jewish cemetery which is still surviving uh, as, a, uh, as, as, as a monument in the town, and that's evidence of a population that probably has origins going back to the Middle Ages, I, was, I suspect. In the 16th and 17th century, which is a period of great economic growth in the town, you can imagine people coming from the Mediterranean region and perhaps even further afield. There were, of course, also people leaving the town. That's something that, uh, as, as, a port, as a point of entry, it was also a point of departure of those people who left the new world. Christchurch Mansion is one of the major landmarks of Ipswich. This red brick Tudor mansion has witnessed many international connections established by Ipswich people with the wider world. This lovely oak mantle records the story of Thomas Eldred, who sailed from Ipswich docks in 1586 and circumnavigated the globe in this vessel. Thomas Eldred's story may have inspired um, Bartholomew Gosnold. Bartholomew Gosnold lived in Otley. His family home was in Otley in Suffolk and he was the first person to found a colony in Jamestown in America, the very first permanent colony. He left England in 1603 um, on a recce, if you like, to go and see where there would be a suitable place to start his new colony. Raleigh had tried and failed to establish a colony in what we now know as the USA. 
He sailed over to the eastern seaboard um, and they looked for suitable places in which to um, start their settlement. And the first place he came to was teeming with fish. And so he called that Cape Cod. And the next place he came to was abundant with fruits and vines. And so he called that Martha's Vineyard. And Martha's Vineyard is named after his daughter Martha who died in infancy. So Martha's Vineyard in America where Barack Obama takes his holidays is actually a permanent memorial from a little girl in Suffolk who never grew up. Ipswich is fortunate in that it's actually conserved many of its buildings. Uh, this includes a marvellous collection of medieval churches, also uh, timber-framed buildings, which aren't always visible, they're often hidden behind later frontages. Ipswich is particularly fortunate in the number of these buildings which it still preserves. There's essentially still a 16th and 17th century town hidden behind the later Victorian additions, which is, which is quite an extraordinary thing really, considering the amount of preservation that's taken place. Even here on the quayside, where you'd expect the greatest degree of demolition and replacement, there are some very significant historic buildings. Isaac Lord's, for instance, which is now a pub restaurant complex, preserves a quite an interesting combination of 16th and 17th century buildings together with a medieval warehouse. Uh, it's a group of buildings that's almost exceptional in the country in terms of the, uh, the significance of the buildings that are preserved. Ipswich, county town of Suffolk, and probably the first English entrepot, maintains its cultural diversity today. Christianity flourished here in old Angle land, and today we can meet Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, people of many different religions. And in this film, we've attempted to track the history of migration. We've looked at trade, architecture, and the development of the English language, which has accepted so many foreign words from different cultures. For example, in Ipswich, I can go to a cafe wearing trousers. I can eat a bagel or croissant, drink mango lassi, and tell them how good it is. And this is so English. But why Selly Suffolk, or as some people say, Silly Suffolk? Well, the phrase uh, Selly Suffolk or, or Seely Suffolk or even Silly Suffolk is very appropriate. Uh, silly in its original sense means holy or most blessed. And that in the Anglo-Saxon period and the Norman period really neatly encapsulates what we see in the landscape of East Anglia. In the Anglo-Saxon period, we see numerous missionaries and, and bishops at work across the region. We see the foundation of literally hundreds of churches, so that by the time we get to the, the documentary history of the Doomsday Survey, we see that most of the parish churches that we recognise from the medieval landscape have already been built. We also see the importance of places such as this in Bury St Edmunds. We have an important monastic site, uh, one of the foremost monastic sites in the country, based on the, the royal shrine of the martyred king, and a site which remains of incredible importance right the way through the uh, later Anglo-Saxon period and into the medieval period, and indeed continues to be so up until the 16th century. Mm -hmm.